Our second scripture reading is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 to 13. And it says this, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are variety, varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. One body with many members. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for being our God. We give you thanks for all the blessings that Pentecost is, and we ask that your spirit be present with us, that your spirit descend upon this place and fill each of us. And Lord, personally, I ask that you fill me with your spirit so that because of me or in spite of me, that I may bring a message to your people. Amen. So it goes without saying that this is not the way um, I wanted to be able to preach uh, my last sermon with all of you. Uh, it is wonderful, and I thank Judy for all the pictures, just to be able to represent many of the faces of the congregation. But as you know, it's not the same to be preaching to pictures on a pew as it is to be preaching with all of you. Um, I'm not a great camera person, but I am, I feel pretty good at face-to-face -face and being, being with people. And that's obviously what I would prefer, but... As I've said many times, I am thankful for the creativity that we have found to be able to make worship happen, to be able to keep people coming together and communing. So even though this is not the way I was hoping uh, for today to go, I am thankful uh, for the opportunity and the ability to do this. And um, as many of you know, when I'm preaching, I carry around a music stand and take that with me. So I didn't want to be behind the pulpit or the lectern today preaching. I figured might as well go out the way I've come in and uh, preach from the, the music stand. Um, and Bob and Hattie, I need to apologize to you in advance. I know you've told me so many times, Bill, just throw the notes away. Um, you don't need them. You know it. You've got it. Preach it. Um, so I apologize in advance. I am going to be using my notes because I wasn't sure how my emotions were going to be uh, today. So I'm trying to keep them in check. But this gives me a security blanket. So I hope you'll forgive me uh, for using notes today. And I, I know that you will. So thank you. Um, I am thankful, so thankful, that my last sermon at Epworth is being preached on Pentecost Sunday. Um, Pentecost is amazing. I mean, come on, you've got tongues of fire, you've got the Holy Spirit coming in, you've got the apostles speaking in such a way that people from all around the world are hearing them and understanding what they're saying. It's 
breaking down the barriers of culture, of language, and everything so that all that are coming are in complete understanding. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have now? Um, in a time where there is unrest and there is discord, wouldn't it be great for the spirit to show up and just even the playing field for everyone? There are so many things that I love about Pentecost, and I'm going to try and uh, hit on each of those things today. Um, so let's jump into it. Or as uh, Paul Harvey used to say, uh, now for the rest of the story. So let me share with you. So the day of Pentecost, just taking a look at that. Last week, we heard that uh, 40 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, that he ascended into heaven. We celebrated the ascension of Christ. After his departure, the apostles waited in Jerusalem for nine more days based on Jesus's instructions for them. After this time of waiting, the Holy Spirit was sent like tongues of fire that fell upon each of them. After receiving the Holy Spirit, the apostles began to fearlessly preach the gospel, and so began the birth of our church. Additionally, there is some strong symbolism in the Holy Spirit coming to Jerusalem in Pentecost. This was a feast day that all were gathered to observe. Um, it was a Jewish observance of when God met his people at Mount Sinai 49 days after their liberation from Egypt and sealed his covenant with them by giving the Ten Commandments. So 49 days for the apostles and Pentecost hits 49 days for the Hebrew people after leaving slavery in Egypt and God establishes commandment. Pretty cool tie in there. And that's just one of the parallels that we see between what God had done for the Hebrew people many years ago and what God was now doing on the day of Pentecost. God had demonstrated his presence atop Mount Sinai 1,300 years earlier. And now on the ground floor of the birth of the church atop Mount Zion, God demonstrated his presence, power, and purpose to all that were gathered in Jerusalem. On Mount Sinai, God gave his commandments on tablets of stone written by God and offered through Moses. On Pentecost, atop Mount Zion, the Spirit of God wrote the commandments directly on human hearts. At Mount Sinai, 3,000 people were judged because of their idolatry. On Pentecost, atop Mount Zion, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus, the Messiah, and became the body of Christ, the church. While this is really cool, and it truly is, I want to shift to talk about another cool practice that, early, that the early church adopted for Pentecost Sunday. I love so many of my seminary classes, but I think one of my absolute favorites was uh, with Deidre Krewald learning about confirmation and Chris, Christian education, but primarily confirmation practices. And we talked a lot about something called the catechumenate. So for the early church, Pentecost was a really important day for them as well. And they adopted this as a special time in the formation of new Christians. So they developed something, we call it confirmation, they called it the catechumenate. And for them, that was a three-year process. So a person would uh, need a mentor from the community of faith to walk with them through this process, and they would worship with them, and they would serve with them, and they would uh, have study together with them, and they would learn from them over the course of three years. Then at the beginning of Lent on that third year, they would make a decision as to whether they, were, they felt that they were ready to go on to become full members of the community. And they would go into more in-depth instruction over the course of that time of Lent. And on Easter, 
on Easter. They would be brought before the entire community on Easter Eve, just before midnight. And they would be baptized, and they would be anointed, and they would be given a new robe, and they would be brought into the sanctuary with everyone, candles being held, and they would be brought in. And at that time, on that early Easter morning, they would have communion with the whole community for the first time. That was that moment of that aha, of them saying, yes, I believe. But for the early church, they didn't want it to stop at just, yes, I believe. They wanted it to go one step further. So after Easter, these same catechumens would gather with their mentor, with their priests, with their bishops, with their deacons, and they would go in in-depth study to discover what their gifts and graces were, what it was that God was calling them to do. Um, so that they could then enter into that and be able to be an active part of the community by doing what God had called them to do. So this culmination would take place on Pentecost. So after Easter, they would spend that 49 days, that 50 days, leading up to Pentecost. And on Pentecost, they would come before the community of faith, and they would share among everyone what it was that God was calling them to do to be the hands and feet of Christ to serve in that community and the community would come around them they would pray for them they would bless them they would anoint them and lay hands on them and send them into that ministry what an amazing what an amazing time and that inspired me, and it blessed me for what we do with the whole confirmation process. But the other thing that I love from that, and I don't want this to be missed, the whole discipleship process for them was not just ending with what you believe, but ending also with knowing how um, you are being called to serve. So it's a twofold thing, knowing what you believe, but then knowing how you can live that out in the life of the church. This is what we've tried to do through confirmation, and this is another reason I am so thankful to be preaching on this day. Over the course of time that I've been here at Epworth, I've been blessed to be able to lead nine different confirmation classes um, with, and I wanted to count it up before today and didn't get a chance to, but over 50 youth um, have gone through those confirmation classes here. And each class has been a blessing and has been amazing. And our confirmation process has been modeled after that early church practice of the catechumenate. We do have our confirmation celebrations on Pentecost Sunday. And over the course of those confirmations, and if you're one of our former confirmands or ex-cons, meaning Christ confirmed, uh, you'll remember these things. But our lock-ins with watching either Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or Moana uh, to get us into the confirmation mood and to help us understand some of the concepts of what we're being asked over the course of the confirmation process. Or maybe you remember our field trips, either to Lovely Lane or Strawbridge Shrine, um, up to see the burial place of one of our local circuit riders who was uh, ordained by Francis Asbury up at Hereford Cemetery, going to the Jewish uh, Heritage and Cultural Center in Baltimore, or even to the Museum of the Bible. You got to be a part of the journey of being a confirmand going on our retreats. In some of the early days, we were at River, River Valley Ranch, and then we shifted over to going to Summit Lake Camp just because of how much a blessing that place was for us. It just encapsulated the feeling of knowing that the Spirit was with us and gave us that ability to be in God's presence to make that determination as to what you were going to claim as your faith. I loved those retreats, just being able to be with you, to gather with you, to have all the mentors together, to have the teachers together, to have the ex-cons with you, and to have each of you to walk through that special time. 
and the ex-cons. So if you don't know what I'm talking about with ex-cons, we came up with this a long time ago. And this is for the youth that have gone through confirmation that have said, yes, I want to be confirmed. I, want, I believe that uh, Christianity is my faith, that Jesus is my Lord. I affirm this faith. Um, the ex-cons are those kids that have chosen to do that, but then want to become peer mentors to help other youth go through that same process. And the ex is the Christian Chi, or for Christ, and Khan being confirmed, so Christ confirmed. Um, I love this process. And the reason I loved it was because of those youth that cared so much about what they had gained through their own confirmation process that they wanted to be able to share that with other youth as well. In fact, it would be on the confirmation retreats that I would have confirmands coming up to me and saying, can I be an ex-con once I'm confirmed? I already know who I want to be an ex-con for. And just to see their excitement uh, in that and wanting to be able to share that faith, the recognition that the spirit was already working within them to generate that kind of excitement that they wanted to be able to share that with others and be a part of um, helping other youth come to faith as well. I love you, ex-cons. I love each and every one of you. You've been a blessing and you continue to be in so many ways. And you know some of the ones I'm talking about. If you've seen Aiden or Isaac share a children's message or um, Molly or some of the others be our, our um, lectionary, lectionary people for, for Sundays and uh, if you ever had a chance to go on any of the retreats and watch them lead a talk or lead a small group, uh, it was just incredible. Our confirmation services too, both our first service where they're giving gifts from the church, our second service where we do a check-in and offer the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, and then our final confirmation service, each and every one of those were a huge blessing and a recognition of what God was doing in their life. And Pentecost was a day that we always culminated that time. I also enjoyed our parent classes, being able to gather with parents and share confirmation with them again. Sometimes it was a reminder. Sometimes it was a brand new thing for them. But I felt like I grew closer to our youth's parents and got to um, invite them in to be a part of the whole youth ministry and to give them the tools that they need for helping in being the parent of their child, but also being a faith formation um, mentor for their child. And then the mentors. How many of you were asked to be a mentor? And we didn't choose mentors for the youth. We had the youth choose their mentor. We gave them parameters and everything else, but it was a youth that may have come up to you and said, hey, would you be my mentor for confirmation? And so many of you said yes and went along that journey. And we got to have time of training together and conversation. You got to be a part of those field trips and the retreats. You got to be a special part of helping another child come along in the faith and learn the faith. You continue to be such an important person in the life of those kids. I know my son still regularly gets in contact with Mr. Matt, and I'm like nodding to your picture, Matt. <laughs> but he gets in touch with Mr. Matt, and they get together for lunch or have conversation or whatever because the relationship that they formed on confirmation was that important to Nathan that he wants to hold on to that for the rest of his life. He knows that he can trust uh, Mr. Matt to be a faithful mentor and person there for him. And while that's true between Nathan and Mr. Matt, I know that that's true for so many of the rest of you too, and I hope that you hold on to that as a blessing. It is so important. And the other thing was being able to help all the congregations see themselves as disciple makers. By having those services, by bringing the confirmands before you, you were all invited in to be a part of confirmation, to be a special part of forming their faith, reminding you that all of us are disciples who are made to make disciples. Thank you for following with us on that journey. 
It is absolutely amazing to watch that. Why is all that important? Why is all that important? It's important because whether it was through Pentecost Sunday or whether it was through the early church catechumenate, whether it was through our confirmation service, the things that we were reminding ourselves and sharing with everyone else, that we are all one body, that we all have one head, which is Jesus Christ, and that equals the church that we celebrate today as the birthday of the church. What God reframed and began anew on Pentecost gave us the assurance that wherever we are and wherever we go, we are the church together. This is necessary as we are called to go into all the world, not just Cockeysville, not just Timonium, not just Hunt Valley, but we are called to go into all the world, all different cultures, all different languages, all different colors, all different variety. We are called to go into that. And if we don't have that spirit of God that showed up on Pentecost and alighted the apostles with the tongues of flame and gave them the ability to speak to anyone about Christ, we will not be able to share that message But Pentecost reminds us that we have that gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to do just that. And we have seen that. We can do that because we are one body, one church, with one spirit, under one God forever. We see that. We have Anna and Nathan in Liberia. We have Abby in Australia. Eric Schaefer is in Texas. He left a really high-paying, big-tech job to become an inner-city teacher in Austin, Texas. He lives in faith community because what he gained here called him and let him know that, one, he was called to work with kids in the inner city, and two, he was called to remain in Christian community to form his own faith and to live out of that. Joy Katanga who is in Georgia and continues to be in ministry uh, in so many ways, Um, continue to pray for her and bless her in the ministry that she's been called to. Jim Bulliard, one of our... um, One of our young adults that felt the call to ministry while here at Epworth and is now an elder in the North Carolina conference and ministering to so many. Britt and Kelly, who were wonderful youth leaders here that are now in North Carolina and continuing to help serve youth and other people within the life of their church. And Barb Fischel going out to Oregon, but continuing to serve in the Methodist church um, and do so many things. And we're so sorry that Ed has gone home to be with the Lord, uh, but we're so thankful for all that they did for our church um, and the many blessings that they offer. Or talking about going into all the world, Dottie and Gary Johansson. How many of us have seen their uh, presentations of their different journeys around the world, but we know that each place they go, they go with their faith open and alive as well. And now the next journey to celebrate is um, the journey that I'll be taking with my family to go into a new ministry and into a new church. But I am part of the one body. I am part of the one church with all of you. We remain connected in that way. That's why I asked Mike to put the image on today of the puzzle pieces. We are all part of one body. We are all part of one church. We are all under one spirit with one God. So even though I'll be ministering someplace else, we are still connected in that way. We are still connected in that one body. And Epworth, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you. I've spent 18 years with you. I've grown with you. I was commissioned here. I was ordained here. My daughter was baptized here. Both of my kids were confirmed here. You've made me a better father, a better person, and a better pastor. Your love, your prayers, your support, our laughter together, our tears together, our work together will always be with me and have formed me into who I am. And I'm thankful to you because I think you've given me the tools that I need to go into this next journey. You will always be with me in my heart. 
You will always be a huge love in my life. You will always be my friends and my faith family. And I'm thankful that we will always be part of the same body, the same church, under the same God. Thank you. Amen.